We have come at last to the conclusion of the best of the rest for the SNES for Nintendo Power's fourth year, and the first year for the Super Nintendo. We have eight titles to cover this time, and while the last episode had a lot of gold, this issue, this episode, more of a mixed bag. We still have some promising games, though, which I'm looking forward to getting to, so let's get started. First up, we have Bill Lambeer's Combat Basketball. The problem with Bill Lambeer's Combat Basketball as a game is with the controls and how the combat side of the game fits into things. On the control front, this game could very easily be controlled with just the NES controller. All you use to control the game are the B button and the D-pad, leaving six buttons on the controller effectively unused. Okay, maybe five since they do use pause button to pause the game. This part too becomes a problem because it means you don't have a button to switch players when you're on defense, for example. You don't have separate shooter pass buttons. It's just, control-wise, a pretty big mess, especially considering that this is a game made for the Super Nintendo. Or at least, released for the Super Nintendo. Further, because of the combat basketball gimmick, pretty much all the penalties in basketball have been eliminated. Now, some of them I get removing. I see you getting rid of traveling, or ru or uh, rushing, or roughing, if you're doing the extreme combat basketball thing. But the game also gets rid of goalkeeping, which means that when somebody scores a basket on you, rather than that team going back to that side of the court while the team who was scored on gets to pass the ball in and gets a chance to advance to the other side of the court and try to get a shot on their own, instead you basically get what I almost describe as the basketball equivalent of spawn camping. The defending team just sticks around while you try to pass the ball back in, intercepts the basketball again, and scores another basket. Wash, rinse, repeat. Further, due to the oversimplistic controls, it is really hard to pass the ball to another player on your team to get the ball to the other side of the court. It means that when you get scored on, you don't just get scored on once, you get scored on several times in a row until you can fi finally get the ball past the opposing players. Not because of skill, but because basically of luck. Because if the AI creates a situation where with the cruddy controls you can pa finally pass the ball to somebody on your team who can get the ball, hopefully, to the other side of the court. In practice, not so much. It makes this game incredibly unbalanced and really not fun. Not fun if you're playing, uh, playing this, well, single player, and not really not fun unless you're playing if you're playing it multiplayer as well. Though theoretically, if you're playing with another human being, you could theoretically tell them, hey, I get backcourt, bring your players back to the other side, on penalty of I will punch you because you are sitting next to me can't punch the AI, sadly. Now, it's totally possible to put together a s sort of amalgam of Smash TV B or another rollerball-esque take on basketball in video game form, but this game is not it. Do not play this game. And if somebody asks you to play this game with them, insist that they, al that they let you take the ball in after you've been scored on, without interference by your t by their team. Next up is Super Ghouls and Ghosts. The Ghouls and Ghosts franchise is one that I'd really like to like, but I've never gotten into. I think part of the reason for that is there's too much trial and error and too much randomness to work for me. A great example is the number of times where I'd have monsters spawn while I was going in mid-jump is... almost absurd. I have no problem with enemies spawning in the air, potentially in the path of a jump, if you're not paying attention. That's assuming a scenario where the player has enough notice to plan their action, like with Ninja Gaiden games, or like with the Castlevania games, though Ninja Gaiden has its own problems 
and Castlevania for that matter with Medusa Head and Birds. But still, by comparison in Ghouls and Ghosts, monsters just spawn, and they pretty much spawn almost whenever. Part of the problem with this is this is, to be fair, a port of an arcade game, and a very good looking port at that aside from some slowdown. And the thing with arcade games is they want your money. They want all of your money. They want all your quarters. They want you to feed every single quarter in there because you, you know that this next time you'll get further than you did the next the last time. This, ne this next time you might beat the game or the level or what have you. Whereas by comparison to Ghouls and Ghosts, you're in a home. You're at home. You've paid your money. And further... This game has, once again, limited continues. And as I've mentioned again in the past, this is a drama I will keep beating. Even though, admittedly, no one in older console generations is around to hear it, there's no way for me to, for, for this, these words to retroactively change history. But still, it bears repeating. There is no reason to put a limited number of continues in a home port of an arcade game. And for that matter, if you use something like a Game Genie or a or the cheat mode on a Retron 5 or Pro Action Replay or whatever get unlimited continues, there is nothing wrong with that. There is no fault with that. In fact, I would feel that that is the real, that is the real best way to play part of an arcade game on a home console is with unlimited continues. And finally, the final problem I have with this game, it is both minor and major, is that it swaps the A and B buttons and what they do in terms of control. A shoots and B jumps, as opposed to A jumps and B shoots. It's actually rather frustrating when playing the game, particularly when the standard on the, in on the Super original Nintendo was A jumps, B shoots, and my muscle memory was wired that way. And do be frank, considering when this game came out, so would the muscle memory of everyone else playing this game. Unless for some reason they had not owned a NES in the first place and came straight in with the Super Nintendo. Next up is the Chess Master, which I will be ranting about less. I have previously mentioned that I really like chess, and I've explained why. One of the programs I used to help to practice against improve my chess skills, though you really can't tell here, was the Chess Master, and in particular the PC version. So with the Super Nintendo version, I was looking forward to seeing how the game's customizability played here, with the different chess pieces, chess boards, views, and the ability to select a chess master to play against, or more likely, to cur to stomp you into the floor. Or at least, having different chess masters, aside from the ones based on historic chess masters, who have particular tactics that you can work against and learn to counter, and that sort of thing. Unfortunately, a lot of the options I looked forward to weren't available. I wasn't able to select chess masters to play against, whereas the PC version had the ability to select opponents based on different legends of the game. I didn't encounter any easy way to change the settings right off the bat. It is entirely possible that this game has a little save thing and this first chess match is meant to calibrate the computer to your skill level, but if that's the case, there's nothing really to say that. And I didn't see anything about this game having a save functionality or battery backup to store your sort of player data in terms of know how you played and work with you to improve your chess play. It'd be cool if it did this, but I don't see it doing that, and that's a pretty big chunk of advanced functionality to expect out of a home console game for the Super Nintendo. And yeah, you could do a lot of great stuff with with the Super Nintendo, and to a certain degree, chess is one of the algorithms that they, algorithms, but games they use to experiment with AI and to sort of test the development of AI. But still, this doesn't quite work here, which is kind of a bummer. Moving on, we have Draken. I hope I pronounced that right. Draken is, frankly, a game with some problems. Some significant problems, and yet both not so much. First is the game uses Mode 7 for its pseudo 3D graphics, which makes it rather hard to give the game any sort of landscape that helps the player find landmarks, which is a big deal in an open world RPG. The game does have a map that you can access through a subscreen menu, which helps. And it's a pretty, I don't say it's a super detailed map, but it gives you the landmarks and approximately where they are and where you're facing to help you get there, but still kind of frustrating. 
bigger issue for me is the fact that the game handles combat through auto battle. It's a problem because it means the player has a limited amount of control over their resource management in combat. You can control tactics and what spells you want characters to use, but that's pretty much it. Now, this is something that over time I could get used to, figure out the tricks of how to make sure that my resources aren't overexpended by the AI, but this normally is not how I play my RPGs. Generally, at least like a limited amount of control in terms of, like, for example, in Persona 3, you can, while you don't necessarily control your other party members, unless you're using the, playing the portable version, you control everything your character does. So I have some influence, even if not a lot, at least a little, over the how the overall party resources are being managed. I'm not going to give this game a straight up recommendation of do not buy, but it's not something I'm going to recommend without reservations. Next up is Ultraman. Ultraman is basically a single player, one round fighting game where you, as Ultraman, take on various kaiju and have to beat them within each stage's three minute time limit because three minutes is how long Ultraman can maintain his giant form in the show. There are in, sto in story reasons for the three minute time limit and also there's the practical time minute of time limit of that's the amount of special effects budget that they can afford to do for Ultraman in terms of for giant guy fighting giant monster. Now Ultraman has a few problems that it prevents it from achieving greatness. First off, the game has a limited number of continues and no real lives. If you die and use a continue, you pick up with the last opponent you were fighting with your life bar full and your opponent's empty, working more like a life than a continue. However, if you run out of these continues, you have to start the game over from the beginning, so it's definitely like a continue in that respect. Having some middle ground, you can start over from the last opponent you reached, but without the handicap of taking away however much damage you dealt to your opponent, would do wonders for preserving the game's difficulty without causing unlimited continues to become something that would make the game too easy. That said, the graphics are alright. Mode 7 is used for the Ultraman growing effect that you'd see in the show, and Ultraman's own movements are very fluid. The various kaiju have less fluid animations, but I'd almost consider that, a, consider that a genre convention as opposed to a limitation of the system in terms of the big rubber suits which look great, but to a certain degree, limit the range of motion that the suit performers had inside them. The controls also have a few problems. Rather than having a single button way to block, by hitting back through a block button, you block by doing a special move command, up and a button. This makes it difficult to block an opponent's attack in a reasonable length of time, especially if you close to melee range. Also, sadly, there's no two-player competitive mode. It'd be neat to have a kaiju versus kaiju fight with one player each controlling one of the kaijus, or one player controlling Ultraman and the other controlling the kaiju. Now, it's a fun enough game, and definitely an interesting proto-fighting game, but it's not quite where it needs to be structurally yet. I hope we get a second Ultraman game, which has some refinements on this formula. Returning to sports, we have John Madden's Football. In John Madden Football, the first game in the series to come to the, to the Super Nintendo, you can see where the franchise is going, but it hasn't achieved greatness yet. The game is a very user-friendly way of presenting a realistic game of football. However, it faces the problem that it doesn't give you all the options to teach you how to play a good game of football. Ask Madden is an option this person of the version of the game, which is a big deal because that's kind of the feature that teaches you what plays to use in what situations, or for that matter, what plays to use in what situations with what team. Also, in passing, it's still kind of tricky to get the receiver where he needs to be to receive the ball. There are a few occasions where I had the receiver in the marked spot on screen, but he didn't catch the ball, and I couldn't tell why. However, with a little automation, that process could be fixed, where you get the receiver in the right place, and he catches the ball. Maybe add a little granularity to the game, or additional functionality, where you have to be facing in the right direction, or you have to press a catch button, or whatever. 
That said, this is an incredibly solid football game which lets you more easily direct passes to the receiver you want to, as opposed to putting them in a general area of the field with good controls for making your way through your opponent's linemen. Really, this is really a game changer when it comes to sports games, and football games in particular, in terms of the level of granularity and detail in how you play a football game, combined with just ta with a new awareness of how to make a realistic football game that's also approachable. Our penultimate game of the episode is RPM Racing. Wow, this is a really terrible racing game. The game is in split screen, whether you're playing with a friend or by yourself, meaning that your field of view of the track ahead is incredibly limited. And some of the game's levels are designed with slopes high enough that if you lose momentum, you cannot beat the level because you can't get enough speed to go up those slopes again. And one of the tracks that has this problem is the first track in the game. That is the kind of thing that shouldn't make it through playtesting. This is spectacularly terrible game design. Skip this game. Wrapping things up, we have the Super Nintendo version of Home Alone. This game, basically, has all the problems the Game Boy version of this game had, with the difference being that this version has nicer graphics because it is on a 16-bit console with color. It still fails, spectacularly, to capitalize on the potential of the franchise for making interesting games. Once again, as with the Game Boy version, skip this game. My pick for this issue is Draken. This is a game where if I just spend a little bit more time with it, I feel like it would groan on me more than any of the other games here. With Ghouls and Ghosts, there's the switching of the jump and shoot buttons, which is just weird and doesn't feel right when you play it. With Madden, there's the fact that later games in the series are much more evolved and much more perfected as games in the series are concerned. I just don't mean in terms of graphical fidelity for modern console Madden games. I'm just even like referring to games from the same console generation. As you get the later Madden games, you get a better grasp of what this game should be controlling, and a better port and better understanding of how these games need to work on a console compared to on the PC, which is how the franchise started in the first place. And I think that those later games would be a better pick than this Madden. So, Draken, the potential to grow on me, it, it works as a game. There's The only problems I have with it are less fundamental issues with the game and more things where if I played it for a while, I get a better grasp of how it works and how the tactic setup is, is done and I could play the game better. And, or rather, understand how the game is designed to play this particular type of RPG and handle its tactics with the not controlling anyone in the party sort of setup that it does. So, next time, we begin Nintendo Power's fifth year, the year where the 16-bit generation shifts into high gear, and an entire genre catches the attention of gamers, and not just an entire genre, but two works in those genre, two franchises, sort of catch the zeitgeist and, and begin a run which continues into the present day. Those franchises being Street Fighter, we've gotten Street Fighter 1 in the past, but not on any of the consoles in the U.S., but now you have to put them in Street Fighter 2, and we have Mortal Kombat, probably the greatest fighting game rivalry in the history of the genre, short of perhaps Tekken and Virtua Fighter. So, that is something to definitely look forward to. I hope you will join me for these episodes of next few episodes. Thank you very much for watching. Once again, thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the show, please like and subscribe to this channel. Subscribe and get you notified when future episodes come out. And liking lets me know that you enjoyed the episode. 
the video on the right will be of the previous episode of Nintendo Power Retrospectives, if you want to go see what I reviewed previously that on that show. And the video on the left will take you to the previous episode of Breaking It All Down, while well, you'll get to see what I covered there. And below that will be a link to my Patreon page if you wish to back the show. Backing the show can get you a mention in the credits, and also, depending on your level of support, you can determine what I do future Let's Plays of on Breaking It All Down and what else I review on that show as well. So go ahead and click on that and back the show. Also, backing the show helps me get the show out more often and improve the production quality of the show, which is good for everybody. Once again, thank you very much for watching and see you next time.